All right, we're going to continue with connective tissue. So let's look at some of the general features of connective tissue. And connective tissue primarily is going to consist of two basic elements. And I had mentioned this <clears throat> earlier in the introduction when we uh, started talking about the different types of connective tissue, is that it's got cells and it's got an extracellular matrix. And remember, the cells are not held very closely together like they are in epithelium, but spread wide apart, and there's lots of ECM or extracellular matrix. Connective tissue cells do not have any free surfaces. Connective tissue is highly vascularized, meaning good blood supply and nerve supply, with the exception of tendons. Tendons don't have the best vasculature, and cartilage is avascular. Um, ligaments are avascular. So when you damage or injure, let's say, a muscle or a tendon, muscles and tendons can heal a lot quicker than cartilage and ligaments can because very, very poor blood supply. So when we're talking about strains versus sprains, strains involve muscles and tendons and they can heal much quicker than sprains which involve ligaments. Um, a strain and a sprain are both uh, stretching anatomical structures beyond their limit and when you stretch muscles and tendons beyond their anatomical limit we call it a strain and when you stretch ligaments beyond their anatomical limit we call it sprains. So oftentimes these words are thrown around interchangeably, but they're not. It identifies different structures. So ligaments, when you sprain a ligament, it could take a long time for that to heal due to poor blood supply. Cartilage itself takes a long time to heal because of poor blood supply. Basically, nutrition and nutrients have to diffuse from adjacent structures. So connective tissue is situated throughout the body, but it's never exposed to the outside environment. Many connective tissue is vascular, except for ligaments and cartilage. Uh, they're highly uh, sensory. They have great receptors for pain, temperature, and pressure. Um, functionally speaking, they make up the structural framework of the body. So your muscles, your bones, your tendons, and ligaments help connect everything. So it's connective tissue, right? They transport fluids and dissolve material. So blood is connective tissue, right? You don't just want to think solid structures um, because blood is actually considered liquid connective tissue. Uh, it protects delicate organs. We have fat and, or adipocytes or adipose that surrounds our organs to protect them. Um, it stores energy especially in the form of lipids. And it helps to defend our body from uh, microorganisms like uh, white blood cells. WBC is white blood cells or leukocytes. Those are because it's part of blood. When we talk of blood, just don't think about red blood cells. You also have to think about white blood cells. Um, the other component that I wanted to mention you know, before we said two, two components, uh, cells and ECM, but there's also ground substance. Um, the ground substance and the ECM, the extracellular matrix, um, or the extracellular proteins makes up the matrix itself. So in that other slide, it talked about cells and ECM. Um, matrix itself, the ECM, is made up of these proteins, these extracellular proteins, but also a ground substance. And the ground substance could be like very firm and rigid. It could be very um, flexible. Um, so just keep that in mind. The uh, ground substance that I was just talking about it helps to determine the, the consistency. So either it's fluid, it's a gel, or it's, it's solid. Um, it contains many large molecules like hyaluronic acid, which is more thick, viscous, and slippery. Very important to make up your cartilage 
in your joints. So high hyaluronic acid is found between any diarthrodial joint or freely movable bone and joint. Um, so the meniscus in the knee uh, has high hyaluronic acid. The discs in your spine have high hyaluronic acid. Um, chondroitin sulfate is a little bit more jelly-like substance that provides support. And then we have these adhesion proteins or fibronectin that binds collagen fibers to the ground substance. And collagen is a really, really important protein. The first type of connective tissue that appears in the embryo is called mesenchyme. And it has stem cells. And we know that stem cells can give rise to other types of cells. They can differentiate. We have cells that end in the word blast. Blast cells are immature cells and they retain the ability to divide and produce more matrix. So an example of that would be fibroblasts, uh, chondroblasts, osteoblasts. Fibroblasts are the most abundant and they are the permanent resident that lies in all types of connective tissue. It's always present and it secretes hyaluron or hyaluronic acid, which is like the cement that holds many uh, epithelial cells together. Chondro, when you see chondro, you're thinking cartilage, so there's chondroblasts. Osteo, bone, osteoblasts. Then there's mature cells that end in the word site, like chondrocyte or osteocyte. These are mature and they can't divide or produce matrix. Macrophages. Uh, macrophages, these develop from monocytes. Um, now, monocytes are always in circulation, they're always in your bloodstream. And when they find some sort of pathogen or lesion or damage to tissue, they leave the blood supply and they go into the tissues. And once they're in the tissues, they're actually called macrophages, which are um, cell eating, large cell eating structures. They engulf bacteria and debris by a method called phagocytosis. So macrophages come from monocytes. Um, when monocytes enter the liver, they're called Kupfer cells. When they enter the neural system in the brain, they're called microglial cells. When they're in the lungs, they're called alveolar dust cells. When they engulf uh, oxidized or damaged LDL cholesterol, they're called foam cells. So, but the functions are still the same. Plasma cells, uh, these develop from B lymphocytes and they produce antibodies. So B lymphocytes evolve into plasma cells. Plasma cells produce antibodies that fight against foreign substances. And these plasma cells that produce antibodies, they're called immunoglobulins, um, like IgA, IgG, IgM, IgEs, immunoglobulin A, immunoglobulin G, immunoglobulin M. Mast cells. Mast cells are a type of white blood cell. They produce heparin. Uh, histamine and serotonin. That's right. Um, your white blood cells can produce serotonin, which is probably why when you're not feeling too well, you're not feeling too happy and good about things. And bowel movements get thrown off quite a bit. Um, so what mast cells do is by producing histamine, they dilate small blood vessels. And when blood vessels dilate and allows more blood going through there, temperature rises because blood is hot and it rushes nutrients to that area and flushes the bad debris away. Uh, heparin thins the blood. So now you have dilated blood vessels, so more blood can flow through. Plus you got a blood thinner that the body produces called heparin. It really rushes and helps to clear out the body. Uh, adipocytes, these are fat cells. They store fat. Fat has some unique characteristics to it. Um, the number of fat cells that you're born with, uh, these fat cells usually don't increase in number. They just increase in size. They hypertrophy and atrophy, hypertrophy and atrophy. Um, these fat cells also store toxins. So it makes us look at um, obesity and morbid obesity a little bit different that maybe it is a maladaptive process where there's lots of toxins that that individual is exposed to and rather than have those toxins release themselves to the neural system they're being hidden from the neural system and they're hiding it in adipocytes and fat cells 
and little by little when that body is ready and capable of handling it, it releases those toxins slowly so the liver and the kidneys can uh, break them down and excrete them from the body. Um, so fibroblasts, adipocytes and these mesenchymal cells are permanent residents. Now remember, someone can have lipolysis or they can have liposuction. They can have fat cells produced, but if their lifestyle doesn't change and they're still introducing themselves to the toxic environment internally and externally, uh, since fat cells come from mesenchymal cells, they can make more. So in connective tissue, you see it's a great picture that shows all these different types of structures where we have fibroblasts. These are these large flat cells and they move through connective tissue and they secrete fibers and they secrete ground substance. Collagen fibers, these are very strong but yet flexible bundles of a protein called collagen and it's the most abundant protein in the body. Your mast cells, which is a white blood cell, they're very abundant along blood vessels. They produce histamine. And we say the histamine dilates the small blood vessels during inflammation and they can kill bacteria. Your plasma cells develop from your B lymphocytes. They secrete antibodies. The other white blood cells, we have neutrophils and eosinophils. Your neutrophils are white blood cells that migrate to the site of the infection and they destroy the microbe through phagocytosis. And neutrophils are the first um, line of defense, like not, not first line of defense, but they're the first to arrive um, and you know try and clear out that debris. Eosinophils are also white blood cells. These typically increase when there's either a parasitic infection or there's some sort of allergic response going on. So that's why when you do a CBC and you look at a complete blood count, you look at these things, right? Well wow, the eosinophil count is really high. Well, maybe they're allergic to something. Or the neutrophil count is really high. Well, maybe there's some sort of bacterial infection going on. Um, or their B cells are really high. Well, maybe there's an infection going on. Remember the macrophages, these develop from monocytes. They too will destroy bacteria and cell debris through that method of phagocytosis. Then we have different types of fibers that we have here. We have elastic fibers, and just like the word elastic, it tells us it's stretchable, but very strong, and it's made of protein, uh, like one specific one called elastin. Elastin is elastic and fibrillin, and these are found in the skin. They're found in blood vessels. They're also found in the lung. Reticular fibers, these are made of collagen and glycoproteins, and they provide support for the blood vessel walls. Um, so all very important. And then down in the right-hand corner, the ground substance, that's the material between the cells and the fibers. It's made up of hyaluronic acid, chondroitin sulfate, glucosamine, and it supports the cells and the fibers. It binds them together and it provides a medium for exchanging substances between the blood and the cells. When people have cartilage issues, typically you'll hear of them supplementing chondroitin sulfate or glucosamine chondroitin sulfate, right? But the problem is it takes a long time. Like people are typically going through a few bottles before they feel any changes because why? Cartilage is avascular. So it's got to get in the adjacent structures first before it diffuses. There's the word diffusion before it diffuses into the cartilage, all right? And movement is really important between the joints because the movement is going to circulate synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is the type of fluid that's located between freely movable joints, whether it's the shoulder, the elbow, the hip, the knees, the fingers, the ankles, the toes. And it's the circulation of that synovial fluid that helps to bring nourishment to the cartilage cells. The more you move, the more the synovial fluid circulates, the more the cartilage cells regenerate. If movement doesn't take place, then those cartilage cells don't regenerate, but they de generate and the degeneration is degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is known as DJD, degenerative joint disease. It's not the same as rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition possibly linked to intestinal permeability or leaky gut syndrome and it's not a uh, rheumatoid 
arthritis is a systemic problem that affects other systems, not just the joints, whereas osteoarthritis affects primarily the joint. And with rheumatoid arthritis, it's usually bilateral, both elbows, both shoulders, both knees. With degenerative joint disease, it could be one hip, one knee. It's not symmetrical. The ECM, the extracellular matrix, is located in the spaces between the connective tissue. The ECM is made up of the fibers, and it's also made up uh, of ground substance. The ECM is what binds us together. A healthy extracellular matrix means reduced pain, reduced degeneration, and you have good function, and which means the opposite is true. If it's unhealthy extracellular matrix, then it means what? Increased pain, increased degenerative changes throughout the body, and decreased function. Because if you decrease the structure or alter the structure, you're going to alter the function. So unhealthy ECM is found in people who suffer from soft tissue injury. So they strain a muscle, they sprain a ligament, um, they, they strain their lower back, they sprain discs, they have disc lesions. These are soft tissue injuries. Um, they routinely suffer repetitious injuries. So whether it's ergonomically related, doing the same thing over and over and over again, and they keep injuring the same tissues over and over and over, that's a problem and can really start to degenerate the body. Uh, people who have difficulty maintaining proper alignment, so poor structure, poor posture, puts a lot of strain on muscles, tendons, and stretches out the ligaments. And people who are experiencing degradation of connective tissues, right? The people who actually have the first three bullets taking place, they will eventually experience degradation of connective tissues and everything associated with that specific region. So with nutrition, there's a way of downregulating the expression of collagen damaging enzymes. These collagen damaging enzymes are called matrix metalloproteinases or MMPs. Matrix, like the extracellular matrix, the matrix metalloproteinases. Now remember, anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme. Proteinases used to be called collagenases. So a collagenase is going to destroy and break down collagen. Proteinases will break down any protein in that area, and everything is made from protein. So you can downregulate the expression of these collagen-damaging enzymes, these MMPs, to support balanced healing of the ECM. So let's take a look at the ECM. You see ECM is found on the right-hand side in tendons, joints, ligaments, cartilage, and fascia. And the extracellular matrix is the scaffolding for cells and is the defining feature of connective tissue. There are non-cellular components and cellular components. The cellular components we talked about before, fibroblasts, chondroblasts, osteoblasts. Um, the non-cellular were the glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, hyaluronic acid, collagen, elastin, fibronectin. So all of these things will eventually be broken down. So um, the extracellular matrix is composed of tissues that serve multiple purposes. It's going to provide adhesion to cells. It's going to act as the scaffolding. They participate in intracellular signaling, which is really important. And they are involved in translating mechanical load into a cellular response. So it's extremely important. When there's an injury of some sort, prostaglandins and thromboxanes are created. And they're going to signal pain and they're going to bring on inflammation. This is supposed to happen. This is not wrong. This is not bad. In an acute situation, these things are great. It's when it's chronic that it becomes a very destructive and bad process. So when you sprain your ankle and it gets red, hot, and swollen, that's the first part of inflammation. Inflammation is the first sign of healing. Just because something is red hot and swollen doesn't mean it's an infection. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It means that it is healing, right? It's red because red blood cells. It's hot because blood is 98 to 99 degrees. 
right? And it's swollen because of the heparin and histamine. Those blood vessels dilate and they're rushing into that area. And there's water that's trying to cool it off and flush away debris and bring in nutrients and blood bringing in nutrients. So the prostaglandins and thromboxanes feeling the pain signals this neurological response to help your body heal itself. When you're not feeling pain, your neural system doesn't recognize it and has, it prolongs the healing process. Chondrocytes in the extracellular matrix release these MMPs into the area of the injury. And MMPs, the matrix metalloproteinases, the great collagen, elastin, and basement membranes. There are different number or different types of MMPs that have an effect on different types of tissue. The MMP1 and MMP13 are very highly researched. Um, they're collagenolytic. These MMPs are the ones that are most strongly associated with cartilage breakdown or co cartilage collagenolysis. Lysis means breaking down collagen and cartilage. Uh, chondrocytes are stimulated to secrete elevated levels of MMPs that once they're activated, they're going to mediate proteolysis, right? Proteolysis, the breaking down of tendon, bone, and cartilage. Oh boy. So now you think about a person, like I had a patient that came in last week and when I said, so, you know, what brings you to the office and what do you want me to help you with here today? And they were telling me that they were having lower back pain, but also a shoulder issue. And I said, how long have you been having the shoulder issue? And they were like, uh, let's see, we're, what year is this? And they went back in time and I'm like, oh my gosh, I go, five years you've been having this? So now I look, now I knew that since they've been feeling pain, for five years, that means that there's not acute inflammation, but there's chronic inflammation. When there's chronic inflammation, now you get the degradation of the proteins and the tendons, the muscle, the bone, and the cartilage. And if that degrades, that's degeneration, and the structure becomes altered, guess what happens to the function? It becomes altered. So I said, okay, well, since it was their left shoulder, I said, why don't you raise your right arm? And I checked the range of motion with their right shoulder. It was great. When they came time to the left arm, very, very restricted. So the longer they have the problem, the more problematic it becomes, the more money they're going to spend to try and get it fixed. And, you know, maintenance goes a long way. You know, when they try and cover something up for years and years and years, now an acute issue becomes chronic and becomes much more serious. It's much easier to take care of things when they first happen than waiting too long. You know, I tell my kids, you know, clean your room at the end of every day, make sure it's nice and organized because if you don't, you ignore it and it's the end of the week, it's a nightmare and it takes forever just to organize the room. So what we're seeing here is just a little visual description where you can see there's the chondrocyte on the left-hand side. You can see the little Pac-Man structure there, the MMP13. You can see the collagen strings off to the right. And the MMPs are released from the chondrocyte in response to injury or inflammation. And it'll start to further degrade and break down the collagen tissue during an inflammatory response. And there's the MMP1s and you got some MMP2s as well that just break it all down. So we can modulate the expression of MMPs to support healthy remodeling of it. Otherwise, look at all these things that tend to show up and now maybe you'll look at these things a little bit different. People that have repetitious muscle and tendon injuries, they don't know how it happened, right? You have people who have fractures. They fracture very easily, and it takes a while for them to heal. Um, I have many college students that I'll see them wearing the boot on their foot, and I'll say, oh, what'd you break, the second or third metatarsal? Yeah, how'd you know, doc? Um, what, what were you doing when it happened? They say, nothing. They just took a step, and they heard a break. So that's a sign of an unhealthy individual, right? It's one thing if they misstep and they trip down the stairs or they fall in a pothole or something or something lands on their foot for the fracture, but just to take a normal step during the gait process and have strains and sprains and fractures, that should not happen unless they're an unhealthy individual with poor diet 
and, um, and poor extracellular matrix. Wound repair can take forever when these MMPs are being expressed. You get degenerative discs. And again, at the spinal level, it's one thing if someone has one degenerated disc at, let's say, C5 and C6, that one disc is blown out from an automobile accident. I get that. But when you have L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, T4, T5, T6, C5, C6, C7, when we see multiple discs, it's like a systemic disease, but it's not rheumatoid arthritis. It's that they have chronic inflammation and all of their tissues are being broken down. So we want to quiet that voice of inflammation. And there's ways of modulating nutritionally these MMPs. Periodontal disease. Um, if you look at the work of Weston Price, he used to look at the mouth in third world countries and determine the health of the community and individuals based on the gums and the teeth. Um, I remember when I got my dog um, and I took my dog to the vet for the very, very first time, the vet said, have you ever owned a pet? And I said, no, this is my first pet. And she said, rule of thumb, healthy mouth, healthy dog. And my dog is 13, has a healthy mouth. We feed the dog well. So um, when you look at people, it's the same thing. When they have healthy gums and healthy teeth, it's a good representation of a healthy GI tract. Look at the tongue, look at the teeth, look at the gums. It's, it's an important part of doing a nutritional physical exam anyway. And when it's poor, it tells you what's happening inside of them. Okay. So the matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors can play a supportive role in the treatment of tendinopathies by limiting the MMP degradation of the ECM. Okay, so this was just one study that was done. Um, here, look at hops and berberine. They modulate MMP13, selenium to address MMP1 and 2, and folate or folic acid to affect MMP9. So think about this when someone is inflamed or they have a particular, you know, pain or shoulder or back and they go to a barbecue and they have a beer. And I don't mean they're getting sloshed and hammering down a whole keg. I mean, you know, respecting the alcohol and having one or two beers, that bitter herb hops is anti-inflammatory. So is berberine. So is selenium. So these are great strategic ways of trying to downregulate the expression of the MMPs. Uh, fibers in the ECM, collagen fibers, elastic fibers, reticular fibers. The collagen fibers are the most abundant protein in the body. Um, it's tough, it's resistant to pull, but yet it's pliable. We see them in tendons and we see them in ligaments. Elastin is elastic. We find them in the lungs, the blood vessels, uh, the ear. Now, from a nutritional perspective, we look at um, elastin is easily damaged by blood sugar. So when we look at blood vessels, they should have the ability of stretching 150% of their relaxed length, right? And then return back to their shape as muscles have the ability of shortening and lengthening. Uh, in diabetes, where there's glucose or hyperglycemia, and there's metabolic issues, the blood vessels can become easily damaged. And that's why there are so many eye issues that take place with diabetics and kidney issues that take place with diabetics. The blood vessels there are very, very small and they're easily damaged. <clears throat> uh, reticular fibers are found in a lot of your organs like the spleen, liver, lymph nodes. They help to stabilize and they keep your blood vessels in their place. They keep the organs in their place despite that pulling force of gravity. It's similar to collagen, but when you look at collagen fibers, a lot of collagen fibers are run parallel to each other. Reticular fibers are not aligned. They're arranged in many, many different directions to withstand forces that enter the body from different directions. There could be some genetic issues or an inherited disorder of the fibrillin gene, um, this is seen with Marfan syndrome, and these are people that end up being very, very tall, very long legs and arms and finger toes. Many of these people we've seen either, uh, you know, in like Guinness Book of World Records, or many of them use it to their advantage and even play in the NBA. Um, but the life-threatening uh, portion of the disease doesn't come from being so tall. 
it's that the elastic becomes damaged and we have a lot of elastin um, in blood vessels. So if you have blood vessels like the abdominal aorta, a very important large blood vessel, and it can rupture or it can lead to an aneurysm that can uh, sadly kill an individual. So um, again, the classification of connective tissue, right? We've got mesenchyme, which is embryonic, and everything arises from that. We also have mucus. When we talk about the classification of connective tissue, there's loose connective tissue, dense cartilage, bone, and blood. Loose connective tissue is loosely woven fibers throughout the tissues. Think of it as the packing material of the body, right? When you go to UPS, then you have something delicate that you want to ship. You put it in a box. You put all those peanuts around it, those foamy things, or now they use those um, air pockets that fill them up just to support it. That's what loose connective tissue does. And that comes in a diff three different flavors as well, areolar connective tissue, adipose, and reticular tissue. Areolar has different cell types. It's got some fibroblasts, plasma cells, macrophages, mast cells. It's got some white blood cells in there. It's got all different types of fibers, collagen, elastin, and reticular fibers. Um, this is very important uh, connective tissue because it separates the skin from the muscle. Right, So if you take your forearm and you pinch your forearm, you're pinching your skin and you feel it separate from the muscle deep to it. That's the area that has a very, very good uh, blood supply and it's a common site for injections uh, for the skin. Right, They can inject right into that area. Adipose, when you look at adipose, unlike squamous cells, right, in epithelium, remember it had the nuclei right in the center. Here, when you look at the nuclei, they're to the periphery. And that's because you don't want to damage those nuclei. There's toxins in there. There's toxins in the adipose site. So um, these adipocytes, um, they're, they produce heat, right? I mean, they keep you warm. They produce heat loss. They store lots of energy because that's where triglycerides are. Triglycerides are stored in, uh, in fat cells and they store toxins and insects and pesticides, right? I mean, you never really see a morbidly obese ant or a morbidly obese mosquito or a morbidly obese, um, you know, spider because they don't have fat cells. And that's why when they ingest pesticides, it kills these insects right away because it goes right to its neural system. Whereas we have a neural system we have fat cells, and when we consume toxins, it stores them for us, right? So when we look at morbid obesity and obesity, we can look at it a different light. Maybe it's just not an individual that has a hypothalamic issue in the brain that just never feels full and they're eating and eating and eating. Maybe it's uh, not an emotional problem. Maybe they don't, you know, maybe they're trying to increase their dopamine and have, you know, chocolate and and eating makes them feel good for that reward system of the dopamine reward system, maybe they're toxic. And by consuming a lot, now all of a sudden, their uh, adipocytes start to increase in size because they're storing more toxins, right? There is no healthy morbid obesity. Those are toxic, toxic cells. And these fat cells are metabolically active. They're metabolically active. They release something called cytokines. And these cytokines are um, inflammatory triggers. So fat cells can make any disease worse. They can create osteoporosis or make it worse. They can cause MS or rheumatoid arthritis or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or at least make those things worse. Okay, Fat cells increase in number until puberty and then right after puberty they just they don't continually multiply they just increase in size so they hypertrophy and we mentioned liposuction as a temporary fix because mesenchymal cells can always regenerate more if their lifestyle doesn't change here's reticular connective tissue it holds organs together like the liver the spleen uh, the lymph nodes now dense connective tissue um, there are more fibers that are present, but, but fewer cells. And the types of uh, dense connective tissue is either dense regular, 
connected tissue or dense irregular connected tissue. Uh, the dense regular connected tissue is found in tendons and ligaments, and then the dense irregular connected tissue is found in the skin, like the dermis. Uh, it's found in scars, um, deep fascia. It surrounds the organs, like the liver and the spleen. And then we have elastic connected tissue, which is found around the walls of the arteries and spinal ligaments. So here we're going to look at dense regular versus dense irregular, and I want you to look at the fibers, the collagen fibers, compare these to these. I'm just going to bounce back and forth. Look at the picture on the right. So you see the collagen fibers are parallel and interwoven bundles very, very nicely. And here they're kind of irregularly arranged on the right-hand side. So these parallel bundles of collagen fibers, they form tendons, ligaments, and an aponeurosis. Um, anatomically, I remember when I did dissection, um, we would look at the fibers. We would look at the muscle fibers. And when you study the fibers and you look at the direction that they travel, it tells you the direction of the line of drive or the line of pull of that. Um, aponeurosis just means a broad, flat tendon. So tendons attach a muscle to a bone, right? When a muscle attaches to a bone, it does so by a tendon. And tendons have at least two attachments, one at the origin and one at the insertion. Ligaments are holding bone in alignment to another bone. So tendons go from muscle to bone, ligaments go bone to bone, and aponeurosis is just a broad, flat tendon. Um, so you may hear of the bicipital aponeurosis or the latissimus dorsi, which is one of the widest muscles of the back that attach to the anterior shoulder. Um, its origin is called the thoracolumbar aponeurosis. Just the fact that the word thoracolumbar is there tells you, oh my gosh, you know, it's going from the thoracics and the lumbars. That's a broad attachment. Um, and it does. It originates from the lower six thoracics and all the lumbar vertebra, a little bit on the posterior ilium and sacrum, goes up the back right under the inferior angle of the scapula and attaches to the front of the shoulder. Okay, when we do muscles, um, you'll be responsible for that type of information, okay? But I believe in repetition, so I plant seeds in these lectures. I talk early and I mention things just so you can hear them a few times throughout the, the course. Uh, and then here are the irregular connective tissue. Um, you know, these are irregularly arranged or interwoven, if you would. So you, know, you think about the eyeball, when you get up in the morning, when you rub your eye, you may not rub it just left and right or up and down. You move it up and down, left and right and diagonals as you're squishing around your eye. And then what happens? It rebounds back to its original shape. When you're getting soft tissue massage and they're manipulating the skin and the tissues, it doesn't deform, right? It bounces right back. It's in the dermis of the skin. Elastic connected tissue, as it sounds, is elastic. It can stretch and yet return to its original shape. So we'll see these in the walls of arteries. We'll find them in the lung tissue because it can expand and contract the vocal cords, which can change and make the voice very low, or it can make the voice very high, right? So elastic. And the ligaments between the vertebra. Um, in terms of elastin and collagen, Ligaments have both and sometimes different ratios of them. So if we look at the knee, the knee joint is a very large joint. It's the largest joint in the body, but it's also the most unstable joint. So because the knee is unstable, we need lots of collagen there to create stability of the knee. Of course, it needs some elastin because the knee is a flexible joint, but because it's unstable, it needs lots of collagen. When we look at the spine, the spine is very stable the way those facets interlock with one another. And when we cover the axial skeleton, axial is everything in the center, appendicular skeleton is all the extremities like the arms and the legs and the feet and the hands. But the spine is very stable. The way the vertebra articulate with one another and the way the facets articulate with one another, they're strong and stable. So it doesn't need lots of collagen, but yet the spine is very freely movable so we need more elastin there and less collagen. 
Um, in terms of cartilage, cartilage is avascular. The chondrocytes produce this chemical that discourages their growth, and it's called anti-angiogenesis. When we look at the word, we'll see angio, an angiogram, angioplasty, that refers to blood vessel. Genesis means the production of, and anti, we know, means against. Um, so all the exchange of nutrients and waste products must occur by diffusion. We have hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is this bluish, shiny, rubbery substance. Um, there's no blood vessels or nerves there, so the repair is very, very slow. But hyaline cartilage is designed to reduce friction at the joints, and it's also called articular cartilage. So hyaline cartilage is found in the knee, in the hip, in the shoulders, in the elbows, in the wrists, in the fingers. Every diarthroidal joint has hyaline cartilage. Fibrocartilage is the strongest cartilage in the body. It's specific for the IVDs, the intervertebral discs, have lots of fibrocartilage. And elastic cartilage, again, it helps to maintain the shape after it's deformed. The vocal cartilages have it, the nose, the ear, all have elastic cartilage. Bone, bone is connective tissue. And there's two flavors of bone. There's spongy bone and compact bone. Spongy bone is found in the epiphysis of the bone, which is the ends of long bones. When we look at different classifications of bones, there's long bones, there's short bones, there's flat bones, there's irregular bones. Uh, long bone has specific um, portions of it, the, like uh, whether it's the humerus or the radius or the ulnar, or even the phalanges, the small little um, bones in your fingers, they all have, um, they're all considered long bones, even the little bone in the pinky. Um, so they have the ends of them, the proximal and distal ends are called the epiphysis. The shaft is called the diaphysis. So at the epiphysis, it's very spongy. It has trabecula, uh, but there's no osteons there. The osteon, which looks like the appearance if you were to cut down a tree and you look down at what's left, all of these concentric rings going around and around and around. Um, that's compact bone. That's found in the diaphysis. And that's the mineral reservoir. It's solid. It's dense. And when we say it's solid, it's not solid through and through. It's actually hollowed out in the middle. But there's a very, very solid, thick perimeter to that but the basic unit of the structure is an osteon. Bones are gonna protect us, they provide movement for us, they store minerals for us, and it's also because of bone marrow, it's the site of blood cell formation. Very important to know the, the makeup of bone, two thirds of the matrix is calcium salt, right? That's the cement. And the one third of the matrix is collagen fibers, that protein. So one third, one third of the bone is collagen. So if there's chronic inflammation, you have these MMPs in circulation, can you understand why osteopenia and osteoporosis is so prevalent, right? They're losing collagen. Osteoporosis is not always just about losing calcium. It could be protein, all right? So if you think about how many homes are made and well-constructed buildings, right? They put these steel reinforcing rods. If you have a look in the city, um, I was around at, uh, at not only Ground Zero at the time of 9-11 of and helping, uh, you know, take care of a lot of the um, uh, Red Cross individuals and welders and builders and, you know, emergency workers, but I was part of the Red Cross and taking care of all of these people. Um, but I was also there in observing the construction of it. They would put these steel reinforcing rods and then they would put cement around it, right? And it's just like how the body is formed, collagen fibers and calcium salts. So there's the concentric rings that you see on the right, that's compact bone, that's the osteon. And the osteon has these different um, characteristics to it, these different uh, parts. So lamella are these rings, these concentric rings that go around, those are called lamella. Um, lacunae are these black hollowed out cavities and what's in the lacuna 
is um, what was at one point an osteoblast. And an osteoblast, remember, is an immature cell that produces matrix, those calcium salts. And eventually, the cement is going to harden. So when it does, the osteoblast gets trapped. Okay, it gets trapped in that space called a lacuna. And now it becomes a mature cell, and that mature cell is called an osteocyte. So an osteoblast produced the matrix, that ECM, the calcium salts. Then eventually when that cement hardened, it got trapped in the cavity. The cavity itself is called a lacuna, but what's in it is called an osteocyte. And the extensions coming off the osteocyte are called canaliculi. Canaliculi. Okay, it allows for one cell, one osteocyte to communicate with another. It creates this matrix of communication that allows them to um, understand what's happening at different parts of the bone. The calcium and the phosphate give bone its hardness, and the collagen fibers give it the strength. So on the left-hand side, we see good normal bone, and when it loses its density, either due to calcium or protein and the collagen fibers being decreased, you get this what looks like codfish deformity. And when that happens, you get this hyperkyphosis. Remember, the thoracic curve is called kyphotic, but when it increases, it's called a hyperkyphotic. And that's because if vertebra from the lateral view should look like this, that's a spinous process, that's a body. This is another spinous process. I'm sorry, another vertebral body with a spinous process. The B is for vertebral body, and then SP for spinous process, okay? This is from the lateral view, of course. Um, the softest part of the bone is the anterior. So this is anterior, and back here is posterior, just like this lady is facing in this direction. So when bone becomes softer, it tends to do something like this. The front part gets narrower. So the one bone on top of it will contour, and then you get that type of deformity. Okay, and now you get this arc, which is this arc here. That's called a hyperkyphosis. Now, from a functional perspective, right, we look at structure and function. When I look at that, as a nutritionist, I would say, well, what's happening to the lungs? Does she have good volume? Can she inhale and exhale? Probably not. So what's going to happen to the amount of oxygen she takes in? What's going to happen to the amount of oxygen that the mitochondria get? What's going to happen to her ATP? What's going to happen to her energy? What's happening to her digestive organs? Right? Everything is going to start to malfunction. Okay? So this may explain why she's complaining of fatigue and tiredness, why the fingernails look white and pale because she's becoming anemic because she's not getting in enough oxygen. Right? Why the tongue is pale and why the brim, the levator, the, the palpable brim under the eye, when you pull the eyelid down, why it looks white and pale and not pink. Blood is also connective tissue. Uh, blood's temperature is about 100 degrees. And uh, the pH is about 7.4 average. The range is 7.35 to 7.45. The volume is a little bit different for males and females. Males have about five to six liters of blood where females have four to five liters. If one is salt sensitive and they eat too much salt, they can uh, retain a lot of water. Um, the increased blood volume will then increase blood pressure. And this is where in the medical realm they use diuretics which excrete a lot of water from the body, which will decrease blood pressure. Um, unfortunately, when you lose water in nature, what do we usually see? Where there's water, there's minerals. That's why we call it mineral water. So when you lose water, you can lose lots of magnesium. And when you lose magnesium, you lose potassium. And now you lose these electrolytes. And guess what happens to people? They develop what's called ventricular ectopy. Ventricular ectopy. The heart just stops and they die on the spot. Okay. Blood is made up of formed elements and non-formed elements. The formed elements make up 45%. That's the red blood cells and the white blood cells and the platelets. Those are the formed elements. And then the unformed elements is the matrix, right? Extracellular matrix is the plasma. That's why blood is connective tissue. It's liquid connective tissue, but it's connective tissue. 
And then plasma, 91.5% of it is water, 7% is proteins, and 1.5% are solutes. That's why hydration is so important. Look at the water content. In terms of water content and hydration, general rule to follow is take your body weight, cut it in half, and drink it in ounces. So if you weigh 200 pounds, 100 ounces of water a day. If you weigh 100 pounds, 50 ounces of water a day. Okay. Red blood cells do not have nucleus, and it's because the function of a red blood cell is it wants to carry hemoglobin, and hemoglobin binds to the gases, oxygen and CO2. Okay. Um, so blood, the liquid matrix is the plasma, that's the extracellular matrix, and the cells are the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. RBCs are erythrocytes, WBCs are leukocytes, and platelets are called thrombocytes. Thrombocytes a clot. They create a thrombosis or a clot. So blood's function, it provides clotting. It's got immune functions because of the white blood cells, and it carries oxygen and CO2. These are some of the different types of white blood cells. We'll get into them in a little bit more detail when we go over the circulatory system. We go over the blood, the heart, and the blood vessels. But to lay down some foundational work, it's always good to kind of hear it now, white blood cells are broken down into granular and agranular. And what defines granular versus agranular is the cytoplasm. When you look at the cytoplasm here, and you look at the cytoplasm here, and you look at the cytoplasm here on the right-hand side, you can see it's very granule. There's granules, and these granules de granulate. When they degranulate, they release these very strong enzymes to break down bacterias. Whereas on the left-hand side, where we see a monocyte and a lymphocyte, they're agranular. They're, it's this nice, clear cytoplasm. So Ben, basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil is granular. When we get into the blood, again, we'll differentiate how you tell the difference between these, but we'll review it. A little bit now, whereas an eosinophil is bilobed, right? There's like one, two different lobes to the nucleus. A neutrophil has anywhere from three to five lobes to the nucleus. And in a basophil, good luck in finding it, right? It's very dark stained. The nucleus looks like an S in there, but the dark stained granules kind of hide the nucleus. Um, erythrocyte also typically stains red because it is a uh, red stain. The basophil for base is a dark blue stain, and neutrophil is neutral. You see a little red, a little blue, um, but phil at the end refers to the type of stain that it takes up. A basophil takes a basic stain. An eosinophil takes up a acidic stain. A neutrophil is neutral. The monocyte Right, these become macrophages, has a very large nucleus. It looks like a kidney bean shaped. Whereas the lymphocyte, the nucleus is just about as big as the cell. Okay, so those are the white blood cells. Platelets, these are involved in clotting. Um, in terms of blood and circulation, in simple ways of increase in circulation is simply move. Every time you move, you pump every fluid in the body, not just blood, but lymph and cerebral spinal fluid. Um, skeletal muscles contract, and there are these one-way valves in the veins. So it's important to make sure that uh, if someone's in the choir or if someone's in the military, that they don't stand perfectly erect and still, but there's some dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the foot to pump the venous return of blood back up. Um, breathing. Just diaphragmatic contractions help to increase circulation. Massage therapy, B vitamins help to increase circulation. The omega-3s, resveratrol and the res wine, uh, garlic, you know, they all increase circulation. Let's see if this one will work here for us. We can do an overview on connective tissue. So this one here is loose connective tissue. Remember that is the cell matrix. This is cartilage under the microscope. It just looks like water droplets there. Um, here's bone, here's blood, and there's dense connective tissue. Okay, so let's look at, let's go to 
loose connective tissue. Here's reticular, adipose, and areolar. Okay, you should be able to identify what loose areolar looks like and what adipose looks like. So if I ask that on a test, uh, on a picture, you can find it. The cell matrix, right? Here is the reticular fibers, elastic fibers, collagen fibers, and all the ground substance. Cartilage, here's elastic cartilage, hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is really important. Uh, looks like, that's the one that looks like these little hollowed out rain droplets, okay? This is more, the fibrocartilage is very, very dense, right? Look at those fibers, how closely packed they are. Elastic is spread a little bit further apart. Here's dense connective tissue, right? This one is the irregular, and then here's dense regular, right? This one, collagen fibers are very tightly bound. And here's elastic. Look at those fibers. They're very swirly and swivelly. You know, they allow them to stretch out and come back to their shape. Here's plasma, red blood cells, and then that's looks like a neutrophil. It's got about three to five lobes there. And then these small ones here are platelets for clotting. Here's reticular fibers. These are mesenchymal cells, epithelial surface of the umbilical cord. I wouldn't be expecting you to know that that's the umbilical cord. A nucleus of a fibroblast. These are collagen fibers and ground substance. Okay, let's look at membranes. You guys are doing great, hang in there. Um, membranes are flat sheets of pliable tissue that cover or line a part of the body. And there's two types of membranes. There's epithelial membranes that show up as either mucous membrane, a serous membrane, or around the skin, the cutaneous membrane. And then around the joints, we have synovial membranes. And you heard me use that word earlier for synovial joints with that liquid and fluid between the joints. So here on the top right, on the top right here, we have the mucous membrane that lines body cavities that open to the outside. So this is a mucous membrane. And then here is a serous membrane. These line cavities that do not open directly to the outside world. Here is cutaneous for the skin on the top. Skin covers the surface of the body. When you hear cutaneous, think of skin and sensory. So we may be getting into neurology uh, towards the end, and you'll hear me say lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Kind of tells you what the function is when it's cutaneous, sensation to a certain part of the skin. And then we have synovial membrane. So this looks like a diarthrodial joint. It's freely movable. There's a synovial joint cavity that contains synovial fluid. Here's a bone, an articulating bone. Here's an articulating bone. And this blue stuff is the articulating cartilage or that hyaline cartilage. And what's going to nourish those cartilage cells are the synovial fluid. So a little movement is always good. In terms of muscle, three different types, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Around blood vessels, we have smooth muscle. Around the heart, we have cardiac muscle. And one of the interesting features to cardiac muscle, although it looks striated like skeletal muscle, is that cardiac muscle has these intercalated discs. And intercalated discs are a unique feature. And that's where if they're pulled apart and you look inside, you'll see those gap junctions there. Um, but both cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle are striated. So let's take a look here. Here is the cardiac muscle. And you can see right over here, you see the gap junctions. But you can see that they are uh, striated. Okay, let's go back. When we look at skeletal muscle on the right, definitely striations. 
you can see them. Like it's got that appearance, like that. And then smooth muscle is smooth, right? You don't see those striations. It's also involuntary, whereas um, skeletal muscle is voluntary. So smooth muscle and cardiac muscle are both uh, involuntary. Skeletal is voluntary. In terms of the neural, last type of tissue, uh, two kinds of cells, the neurons and the neuroglial cell. Neuroglial means nerve glue. Uh, it's the most, uh, most neurons have a cell body, dendrites, and axons. Neurons carry sensory or motor information, and they perform integrative functions. So I like to look at, and if you look at your hand and your forearm as an example, I'm going to do uh, a simple drawing here for you. So there's the hand. It's a little bit crude, right? And then let's say here's the forearm. That would be equivalent to like a cell body. And then it has many dendrites coming off of it. And then one axon. Think of it that way. So this is an axon. This is the cell body. And these are dendrites, the branches of the tree. Okay, and you'll see that here. Here is the cell body. There's a nucleus of the cell body. These branches, let's see if I can change the color for you guys. Let's make this blue. So this and this and this and this. All of these side branches are dendrites, and this is an axon. Okay. Dendrites are going to bring information into the cell body, right? So sensory information is coming in. This is going to process it, and then the motor information is going to come out through the axon. So think of the A in axon, A for away. Here's just another great illustration and picture of all those landmarks. The neuroglial cells are not electrically excitable, whereas the neuron is electrically excitable. The neuroglial cells repair the tissue framework after an injury. They can perform phagocytosis. They provide nutrients to the neuron and they regulate the composition of the interstitial fluid surrounding neurons. Okay. There are more neuroglial cells than there are uh, neurons. Let's look at the overview. So here are neuroglial cells. That's the neuron, right? So think of it like the neuron would be a star in space, and neuroglial cells is everything that surrounds the star. And in neuroglial cells, there's different types that we'll talk about when we get into neurology in more detail. We will talk about the um, microglial cell, which has macro, it's like phagocytic, it's a macrophage. We'll talk about ependymal cells that make cerebral spinal fluid. We'll talk about the astrocyte. Astro means star. It makes up the blood-brain barrier. And then the Schwann cell and oligodendrocyte are similar in function. Um, it's like real estate, location, location, location. Um, Schwann cells are going to myelinate. They produce this cholesterol, this fatty substance to protect the nerve in the peripheral neural system. Whereas the oligodendrocyte does the same thing. It myelinates, but it does it in the central neural system, the CNS, which is the brain and spinal cord. If it's anything other than the brain or anything other than the spinal cord, it's peripheral neural system or the PNS. Okay, and that would be the Schwann cells function. When we look at the neuron, we have the cell body, nucleus, dendrites, and the axon. Okay. Let's go back. So we know that the neuron is electrically excitable. You'll hear words like action potential or voltage. That's all neurons. And let's talk a little bit about tissue repair and restoring homeostasis. Tissue repair is the process that replaces worn out or damaged or dead cells. The epithelial cells are replaced by the division of stem cells or undifferentiated cells. 
or, and, but not all connective tissue cells have the ability to repair. Muscle cells can perform limited repair, cartilage, some limited repair, ligaments, limited repair. Um, some neural cells can perform limited repair and others can't. So when it damages in the CNS, the brain or the spinal cord, no repair. When it happens in the peripheral neural system, it can repair. And the fibrosis is the formation of a scar tissue. So whenever there is a tissue that's been injured, the very first sign of healing is inflammation. And that shows up as redness and swelling and heat and pain. It's not a bad thing. In the acute stage, it's good. Chronically, it's very, very bad. The repair process is what we call regeneration. When there is an increase in pathogens or toxins or waste products, this is going to stimulate the release of uh, mast cells, which is going to increase the release of histamine and heparin and prostaglandins. These are going to increase blood flow, pain, and increased vessel permeability, which is that swelling and edema that people see. This is going to be hot. It's going to increase the temperature, but because there's more red blood cells, increase oxygen so that the mitochondria have the fuel to help in the regeneration process, uh, nutrients, and there's going to be phagocytic activity to remove the waste products and the toxins and bring in good nutrients. And the result is going to be regeneration and normal tissue is restored. So to maintain homeostasis, it's going to go through inflammation and regeneration, the two main steps. Inflammation, normal response. It's the tissue's first response to an injury. They used to say, when you sprain your ankle, put ice on it. They don't say that anymore. They would say rice. Um, I think it was like raise it, um, I put ice on it, the CIFA compression and EFA elevation. We don't do that anymore. Ice slows down the healing. I mean, it's the right tool for the right job. If you want to suppress pain, fine, put ice. But if you're suppressing pain, you're suppressing inflammation and you're slowing down the healing process. So the signs and symptoms of inflammation are swelling, redness, heat, pain, all good. It's not telling you something's wrong, right? Oh my God, what's wrong? It's like, oh my God, what's right? The body is functioning, bravo. The inflammatory process can be triggered by trauma, some physical injury, and even infections. There's the presence of harmful pathogens can, that can do that. When the damaged cells releases the chemical signals into the surrounding interstitial fluid like prostaglandins, proteins, potassium, they are going to promote inflammation, which is going to heal. Um, cells break down first, right? You got to go through a catabolic state before anabolic. You got to break down before building up. Hair breaks down, then it builds up. Skin breaks down, it builds up. Bone cells break down and build up. Red blood cells break down and build up. Muscle cells break down and build up. That's what makes muscles hypertrophy and get larger with exercise. Uh, lysosomes release enzymes that destroy the injured cell and they attack the surrounding tissues. Uh, when tissues are destroyed, we call that necrosis. It actually shows up as like black dead tissue. Um, so necrosis that you, you'll, we'll end up seeing that later on, uh, when we get into the heart, we'll talk a little bit more about necrosis, uh, necrotic tissue and cellular debris, like pus, they accumulate in the wound. Um, if it gets trapped in there, it forms an abscess. We've seen people that have, um, a tooth abscess or they'll get an abscess or inflammation up in the gums. And the injury is going to stimulate mast cells, which again release histamine, heparin, and prostaglandins. Uh, prostaglandins signal a lot of other inflammatory processes and do create pain. Histamine vasodilates, it dilates the blood vessels, and heparin thins the blood. The dilation of the blood vessel is going to increase the blood circulation to the area. It's also responsible for increasing the redness and warmth. The more blood, the more red blood cells, the more oxygen, the more nutrients, and it also helps to remove the waste products. Uh, the process of inflammation, plasma will diffuse in the area that will cause swelling and pain, and the phagocytic activity of the white blood cells will clean up that area. And then you have regeneration, right? The healing. That's when new um, tissues are actually laid down, new collagen is laid down, and a scar tissue may, may form. Um, the new cells migrate to the area or are overproduced by mesenchymal uh, stem cells.
but not all tissues can regenerate. We know that epithelium and connective tissue can regenerate pretty well. Uh, CART cells and neurons do not regenerate or they just uh, regenerate very, very poorly. So uh, you can read up on these last few steps because I know this video, <laughs> I, I believe the mind can only absorb what the buttocks can endure and we're probably just a little bit over maybe an hour and 10 minutes so far. Um, but you can go through these steps. This is a good visual of what we covered and explains everything that I already discussed. Um, so I think you guys got a lot from this lecture. There's a lot of things that are starting to come together. Um, so, you know, if you need to listen to it again, feel free, take some good notes, have fun. I hope you're enjoying and we'll see you soon.